Yeah. If I have time. Yes, sir. Can you just spend a little, I know I'm being respectful of your time, but just tell us a little bit more specifics about your ideas to bring the business back. I'm so glad you said that. Number one, <laughs> under spending, it starts with a taxpayer's bill of rights. Our administration will get one passed. Now that's important because at this point, we went from 34.6 billion in fiscal year 12 to 36.9 billion in fiscal year 13. That's a $2.5 billion increase, about 7%. What's CPI? 1.5%. That means, again, your state government is doing six times, of the, the, six times as fast as your wallet. We've got to pass that. Zero-based budgeting as an economic policy for all our departments. What that means is, we're going to start with where you were last year, take 3% and subtract it, and then every secretary has to come to my office and defend and tell me why they need to spend every penny. They didn't know how many employees, how many people they employed, how much they pay them, and what their products, services, and goods are for the people of Maryland, and which ones have outlived their usefulness. Would it surprise you to know, would it surprise you to know, that most secretaries in Annapolis right now don't even know how many people work for them. And it's your money they're paying them with. That's right. When it comes to transparency, we're going to create a board, a citizen's industry board. This covers both transparency as well as regulation. Because no more in our state of Maryland will academia, will academia regulate any industry with that experience. That goes away and that stops when I get elected. Regulation is driving business out of the state at the rapid rate. We've been down the eastern shore. It's killing the water. It's killing farmers on the eastern shore and in western Maryland. And in industries here, it's kicking manufacturing companies right out of the state. As a policy, if we are going to regulate an industry, it must be done, plain and simple, with those that have experience in that industry or will not be done at all. When it comes to first responders, well, I'm going to roll. I, can't, I was so glad you asked me that. When it comes to first responders, our first responders, absolutely ought to have, let me set it up this way, let me tell you what the statement, they ought to have a tax-free salary. Let me explain myself before you throw me out. When I was in Kosovo as a Marine officer, I was a, my platoon was assigned to a little area called Sernicha. We were nothing more than a glorified police force. We had to demilitarize the village so those that lived in Sernicha could come back to their village and to their homes. Every day that I was acting law in that town, almost 67, 68 days, it was nerve wracking. It was stressful. Because we, we were getting pot shot at, and one side would blame the other. Do you know how difficult a, a situation, how frustrating that is, when you can't even tell who's with you and who's not? Our first responders go through that every day. A routine yeah. traffic stop yeah. could end up with them losing their lives. Why shouldn't their pay? Now my pay, every day I was in combat, was tax free. Why shouldn't our first responders have their salaries tax free. It's not like they haven't had a pay increase in seven years. Exactly. They deserve it for what they do. They put their lives on the line for, to help, to help protect our freedoms. We absolutely do that, not just for our first responders and their salaries, but also for their pensions. How much more safe would your neighborhood be if more of your sheriffs stayed here and didn't move out of state when they retired? Exactly. It has to happen. The second part of transparency, I don't give them a whole thing on it. When it comes to non-legislative and non-elected boards, no longer will they have the power or the authority to raise fees or taxes on their citizens. If we had had this position in place, you'd still be paying $2.50 to cross the Bay Bridge and not $6. The Public Service Commission is killing people in Montgomery County by allowing Pepco to increase more and more of their rates with a service that's not even reliable. Pepco has the worst reliability in the country. On top of that, they've been sued for over a million dollars for the, un for the unreliability, and they turned around and increased the fees of the citizens to pay the fee. But it took the Public Service Commission to allow them to do it. And the Public Service Commission is not elected. They're appointed and they serve at the will of the governor. That's cronyism at its best. We will take, we will, we will go back to the Maryland Constitution. We will take the power away from these non elected and non-legislative boards and commissions, and we will not give them the ability any longer to raise fees or taxes on citizens. Immediately. <laughs> Last piece when it comes to education, because I covered parent and student school choice. One more piece on education, very important to me. And I, I cheated because I actually lived with a teacher on this one. We need to make sure that our educators that are coming out of Maryland, and I'm going to use the Board of Regents to do this, to take a look at what their curriculum is, 
to ensure that our educators are properly prepared to educate the 21st century student. I think that students are changing. I don't think that all children learn the same, the same way they did a century ago. I think we're becoming, we're becoming so diverse that you're gonna see different types of, of, of school organizations, charter schools, private schools, that are gonna rise up and compete for your children to go to their schools. Okay. So we wanna make sure that every teacher that we provide, or not provide, but we graduate out of the Maryland system is educated with a curriculum that prepares them to prepare our children for the 21st century. If Steve Jobs were alive today, he'd tell you the primary reason why he left for China to, to further develop his iPads was because the engineers were a dime a dozen there and they're scarce here because we're not producing them. In some cases, I believe our teachers should be able to benchmark, not just outside their county, but outside their state and maybe in some cases outside their country to find out what types of things work best in the area of education so we can take our educational system to the next level because I am tired. I am sick and tired <coughs> of, of leadership standing up and saying that we have the number one educational system in the country when that number is not based upon scholastic scores or academic performance, but rather it's based on how much money per student we spend per student and we, you and I both know more money does not equal a better student. Right, right, right. Uh, she asked a question. What would I do about Common Core? My brother can answer that question. Common Core is unconstitutional. There's a little something, a little something in, the, in the federal constitution called the Tenth Amendment, which is your Bill of Rights. You know what that says? I know you know. You better know, brother. What that says is any power that is not directly given to the federal government by this constitution is left up to the states and to the people. So, when it comes to education, I would look at the federal government and say, listen, you can keep the idea. I'm not going to force it on my citizens, but I will present it to school boards and tell them at the local level, you can use some of it, none of it, or all of it. It's your choice, but you still have the standard of educating our children. For me, it's that simple. I don't want to brainwash. I want them to tell the truth. Absolutely. And believe it or not, so how, how are those 6,500 I sure do. I sure do. I love you all. I take 98% of you all are with me. The only way to get them back, well, not the only way. One of the ways we are looking to get them back is we've got a business roundtable, and we're starting to identify them because we have the roles and we know who they are. And through our business roundtable, we're, we're going to be as bold enough as to contact them. Give them a call and offer them a year or two years tax-free to come back to our state after 2014 once we get elected. We do all kind of outside the box thinking incentive stuff to bring those small businesses back to Maryland. And I believe they want to come back to Maryland. I talked to one that left us for South Carolina because we had a governor that looked, in, looked at his face and said, well, where else are you going to go? In response to him saying the taxes are too hard ones. So we're looking and identifying where and who those businesses are because we want to go after them and bring them back. One of the things that I intend on doing firmly is that little sign at the bottom when you come into Maryland, it says, welcome to Maryland, Governor O'Malley. We're going to take the government part off, and it's going to read, we're open for business. Yay. Yes, sir. <coughs> we're going to take a look at all 74 new taxes passed in during this administration, determine which ones we can eradicate, completely do without, and take them one item at a, at a time. In addition to that, we're looking to take taxes currently down to 5%. 5% sales tax. 5% personal income tax, 5% personal And I understand why and what they're doing now. Keep this in mind. This is very important. We push so many businesses out of the state of Maryland that they have no one left to tax. That's why they come with this stuff called a rain tax. Because they have no revenue they can bring in. We did nine and a half billion dollars of our revenue come from the federal government. That's 25% of our economy. But yet we're the third wealthiest state in the country. We'll look at every single one of those tax and regulations. We're going to take some tax power away from these non-legislative bodies. We're going to do it the right way by scanning them back. Now, I do realize that it's going to take time for us to drive it down. But if, if we do this right, if, if, if every state department, every, excuse me, every secretary of each department does their job the way I'm asking them to, we're going to find immediate savings off the bat just because we can do it within our own departments across the board. We have $9 billion to cut. 
All I want to do is keep from having to grow the government any at all over my four years, and I will call that success. If I can go in to this governorship at 36.9 billion and leave at 36 billion, I've done a very good job. That's all we need to do. And we'll be sending refund checks home every year that I'm in office. Yes, sir. How will uh, all your implementations sound really good, mm -hmm. but how will they all fare against these partisan Democrats down there that you have to deal with in the House and the Senate? Because Bob Ehrlich did, was against the wall for four years. Yes, he was. I mean, anything he proposed is just about it. Yeah, Bush and Miller and all those people down there, they say, you know, they, they basically went, go with it. Yeah. There's a benefit from having business experience. And I'll, by that, all that, all, but the only thing I mean by that is this. I, we started over 12 months ago working in Prince George's County, Baltimore City, Montgomery County. Because that's where the votes are going to come from to, to put the Democrat in office. Believe it or not, we were thrown so many curveballs by our own party because we're spending too much time in those areas. Which to me is almost laughable. Because if you don't spend time in those areas, you can't win the election. Right. Right. And sanity is defined by doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Because we've been there for the past 12, 14 months, we've established relationships with community leaders, elected officials, and everyday people in those areas. We have two elected officials in Baltimore City that are actually going around Baltimore City to get us elected governor and to win 50.1% of the vote in Baltimore City. Yeah, because no. the, the people have to the people have to get rid of some of these delegates and senators. Right. That that is so so uh, majority unbalanced uh, right out there. But see the beauty of it is make your job easier if it happens. It is. You're making my point because when I have a policy that I speak that I speak so strongly on, which have been the seven or eight that I've introduced here, and I get, I don't know, a delegate from Baltimore City that doesn't want to play baseball with me, don't want to have the politics then I'm going to have a forum in his district and invite his constituencies and the community leaders from his district that supported me and then put them in the same room with them and then ask him in front of his constituencies, why would you believe in these policies when I know I have all their constituents on my side? The beauty of our form of government is the power is not in the hand of those delegates. The power is in the hands of those people that vote those delegates in. And it's interesting how quickly people change their tune when they realize that their people aren't with them. I intend to use that bully pul pulpit perfectly and execute it in perfect time by having not just quarterly forms, and my forms that we have will be in Democrat strongholds as well as Republican. Because that relationship that I can build, when it's time to get a policy through, I'm going to go right back to that community. I'm not going to sit there and twiddle my thumbs and say, guys, why don't you play fair with me? Instead, I'm going to say, you know what, okay, you don't like that idea? Then what do you say we go to Glen Arden? And we have a forum out there. Oh, okay, okay, Governor, look, what do you need from us? I thought you'd say that. I thought you'd say that. The second thing I intend on doing is within the first 90 days that I'm elected governor is have a one-on-one -on -one with every elected official in the House of Delegates and the State Senate. Closed door, just me and them. You know why? Simply say, hi, my name is Charles. I got four daughters. How about you? Where are you from? You've been in Maryland all your life just to establish that initial bit of relationship. Would you believe that has not been done before? See, I'm not going to play games the same way others have done in the past. I'm not accusing anybody. I'm just saying I'm not going to play those same games. I want to build relationships so we can take care of the people of Maryland. At the end of the day, human capital and people are what's important. And we can move them one way or the other. We can move them with us, or we can move them through their people to move with us. But my epiphany happened to me when I was in Saudi Arabia. I've been deployed uh, three times since I've been in the Marine Corps. The last time, thank you, the last time, the last time I was in Saudi Arabia, and my job on the Saudi Arabian Peninsula for nine months was to train high-level officers, Islamic officers, that were considered America's friends in the area of unclassified intelligence gathering. These were supposedly our friends to hear the things that they said about America. To hear the things they said about our president. To hear the things they said about us. That entire 23-hour trip home, all I could think of was this. How stupid are Americans that we argue with each other over skin color and party affiliation when there are nations that hate us. They hate our way of life. Our problem is we don't get out enough.
When you have enough time to argue over who's Republican and who's Democrat and who's black and who's white, you know what you forget? You forgot the fact that nine people boarded a plane with one purpose in mind, to kill us. They didn't stop to see who was black or who was white when they went to that trade center. All they cared about is those were Americans. It's time for us to stop being so, so. And I'll leave it there. <laughs>